you for joining us today. Good morning, good morning, or good afternoon if anyone's joining us from another time zone. Uh, my name is Rosa Cisneros. I am part of the WEAVE team. I'm at the Center for Dance Research. Um, I am very lucky and very honored to be sitting alongside many wonderful WEAVE um, people, that uh, partners that help make this day happen. We have a lovely, um, very exploratory day um, planned for you. Uh, we are um, here at the Lab Day for Dance, Archives, Disability and Able-Bodiedness. Um, it's a little bit of a different way that we're framing this lab day today as we are looking to raise questions um, that perhaps need to be more explored around narratives, language, equality, all linked with dance, um, disability and able-bodiedness. Um, we've curated this day with a number of um, individuals who have also been thinking about these questions um, and later a little bit later we'll meet them and, and we'll, we'll hear more from them um, but I just want to remind everyone that today we're coming from a place of looking and um, yeah our experiential embodied um, ex realities um, not as experts I know often our lab our weave lab days have a a real kind of claim to expertise but today we're, we're changing that because we'd like to just explore this from the messy um, yeah questions that, that arrive as we're looking and opening up some really sensitive uh, questions around disability and dance and archives and institutions and what that means for the cultural heritage sector when we're looking at tangible and intangible cultural heritage. Um, so thank you everyone who has joined us today. Thank you to the Weave partners, those that are here and those behind the scenes. Um, I am Rosa Cisneros, as I've mentioned before. I am a, for those that would like or would benefit from an audio description, I am a female sitting in a chair. I'm olive skin tone. I'm wearing a sea foam colored jumper. Um, that's quite um, thick in its material. Uh, I have sea foam dangly earrings. My olive uh, skin tone is uh, has, and I have black hair that's been pulled up. And I'm sitting in front of a burgundy wall. Thank you all. As we've said, this is an exploratory um, lab day, so we do ask that you are respectful and mindful and are aware that maybe some of the questions might be clumsy or the there might be different ways of using language or different terms. Um, if something doesn't sit well with you or if you have some questions, feel free to um, message myself, Marie-Louise or Kozer from the CovUni team and we'd be happy to support you. We also are very happy to continue conversations after our lab days. So again, this is um, a, a safe space for all of us. I might say brave space because oftentimes even asking a question that's not quite rightly there or not well formulated, it takes a little bit of courage to do that. So please know that you can do that. Um, we are recording the day. Hopefully, if we all agree um, afterwards, the, I, mean, I mean, all agree the participants, um, this will go live afterwards. Um, and we are also using the chat space. We have um, a Padlet that we'll be sharing with you. You should have received the links to that. Um, and if you are on Twitter, we're using social media. Please do feel free to tag us. Thank you, Marie Louise. Marie Louise has um, put all of our hashtags and Twitter handles in there. We have a website, we have a newsletter, we have several lab days that we've curated under the capacity building strand of the project happening in the next two months. So please do um, visit our website and join us for all of these conversations. Without further ado, I would like to welcome my colleagues that are here today. I think um, we have Jonas, Staff, Iris, I'm not sure if Kate's made it in the room yet. Yes, Kate's here, yay, Kate. Um, hello, welcome, welcome. 
So maybe we could do a round of introductions. As I said earlier, we are positioning ourselves with many hats because we all wear many hats and we're starting our conversation from a position of non-expertise and just from our lived and um, personal stories, maybe um, artistic contributions. So again, I hand over to my colleagues. Who would like to go first? I see Kate has burning eyes. <laughs> <laughs> um, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Rosa. Um, my name is Kate Marsh. I am a um, disabled woman. Um, I'm an artist and a research fellow at CEDA, the Centre for Dance Research. Um, I'm sitting today in a, um, a rehearsal space, which feels new and rare. So I'm kind of angelically lit as well by, by some overhead lighting. I'm also wearing a thick uh, jumper today because it's quite cold. Um, I have um, white skin and my hair, my long brown hair is tied up in a ponytail this morning. Um, and I'm, I, I, in, to be transparent, I'm, and to acknowledge Rosa's comments, um, I'm relatively late into this, um, this collaborative group. So um, I may, my questions may be messier, <laughs> um, but I think that offers an interesting perspective maybe that um, I will provoke from a different perspective. Um, I won't say too much because we'll have more time, but just to, acknowledge Rosa's comments around mess and um, uh, lived experience and embodied perspectives. And that's very much the core of my research generally. So I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to be in the company of such um, great colleagues and friends. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Jonas, you look, or is that? Yes, yeah. I can. Uh... <laughs> I can go. Uh, okay, so I also start with an audio description. I'm a, a white male, um, ticking all the boxes you can imagine uh, in relation to white maleness. Um, so I am a white male uh, wearing glasses. Uh, I have short hair, although hair is, is maybe a euphemism, but um, I have short hair and a, a short beard and I'm sitting in a office space, in my office space, which is uh, white and which has a curtain in the back and I'm wearing a, a, a thick cardigan. Uh, so a little bit about my position, I think I come from a bit of a, a little bit of a different uh, background uh, in the sense that I, I want to say uh, from the outset that I am not here uh, or my entrance into uh, disability dance or crypt dance is less through lived experience and more through um, my research, my uh, research into dance, my research into uh, embodied dance practices. And from there, actually my interest into different types of rethinking uh, dance, rethinking embodiment, rethinking those notions which are so typically associated with dance through uh, lenses that allow us to, yeah, to open up these, uh, let's say, often narrow-minded concepts of uh, dance. So I'm uh, very interested and fascinated by everything which surrounds uh, crypt theory, uh, crypt theory and dance. Uh, and this is also something that I'm, I'm currently doing research on. So we are working within the University of Leuven. So I, maybe that's important to know. I'm working at the University of Leuven, so the KU Leuven, within the faculty, uh, within the Department of Cultural Studies, and we are doing research on the intersection of dance and disability. We will, uh, we host a class on this topic, and we also, uh, we will also organize a symposium on this uh, later this year. So I think this is uh, enough for me to situate myself. Thank you. Thank you, Jonas. Iris. Yes. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, I'll start with a, a small audio de description as well. I'm a female. Um, I have uh, Asian features in the eyes. I look a bit too white in the winter for my skin tone. Uh, I have colored thick uh, black hair. I have a round face. I have transparent uh, glasses. I'm at an attic where you can see in the background some plants. 
and also me, I'm wearing a thick cardigan, which is colored uh, for the cold. Um, voila. Uh, I'm in my late uh, 40s. I mainly work as a choreographer, uh, a dance coach and a teacher. Uh, I have a background as a professional dancer. Uh, I was trained in a classical way and then found my way to contemporary dance. So I was very much a performer um, and I uh, became interested in inclusive dance practices um, very or in the beginning already uh, of my career. And uh, the last uh, four years, I wanted to go more on a theoretical research. So I uh, followed the uh, cultural studies at the University at Leuven, where I met Jonas. Um, to see how I could frame more my practical experiences as a dancer and what I've been observing out of a, a experience and to see in theory what that could um, maybe redefine and change or frame it in, in different ways. So I was very uh, interested in, in redefining experience that I have lived concerning um, dance studies and um, getting introduced in uh, disability studies as well. Voila, that's a bit, I think, my short introduction. Fantastic. Thank you, Edis. Thank you. And staff. Hi, everyone. Um, you can hear me, right? Um, my name is Stafos. I um, wear glasses, short beard, headset. Um, and a reddish blurred background. It's blurred from last time. <laughs> now it's blurred again. Uh, and it's uh, there, there's a reddish light uh, coming through red curtains I got from my grandmother, and uh, which like light my everyday uh, work here at home in my home office. Um, my why am I here? Um, well. I'll start my story with the fact that I'm uh, trained as a historian, a cultural historian, um, and uh, then got interested in dance history. Uh, so the books you see shining through in the background, that's really my starting point or has been my starting point for this adventure. Um, and then I uh, started working in the heritage sector in Flanders in Belgium, which is where I live. Um, and uh, I work for SEMPER, the Center uh, for the Heritage of Music and Performing Arts here. And we are, um, we don't have a collection. So we are not an archive institution or a museum, but we are a service provider. We try to support uh, everyone who is involved with the heritage of uh, music and performing arts. So we try to support both the, the existing institutions, museums, archives that try to, you yeah. know, relate to, to that type of uh, heritage, but also we try to support uh, artists and communities in how they can relate to that. Um, but then the other side of me, well, my body has a disability, say. Uh, so, um, and when I was also teaching uh, dance history at the Conservatoire in Antwerp to dance students, uh, Iris uh, asked me to do that, but also Iris dragged me on into the studio, the dance studio, to have some amateur dance experience, which is already a while ago now. But um, so then suddenly these other aspects of my life, say, uh, started to, you know, uh, interfere with my uh, bookish approach of uh, history and heritage. So, um, and this is what brings me here and with many questions on how we can, uh, I can, reconciliate this interest in the past as a researcher, as a heritage worker, as we say in Flanders, so in the heritage field institutionally, uh, with then this aspect, this interest in um, um, empowering artists and especially artists with uh, disabilities. Well, I think that's, that's enough for now. Thank you, staff. thank you. 
Um, thank you everyone for sharing and for also um, positioning yourselves on in today. Because um, as I started the, the conversation, we all wear multiple hats and we're in this space obviously bringing that experience and knowledge with us. But today we are arriving um, from the perspective that you guys uh, just, that we all just shared. Um, and so I think it's, now that we have an understanding of, of who's in the space and, and how we're going to talk, it is important to frame it within the WEAVE project. The WEAVE project is an EU funded, CEF um, funded project that is stands for widening European access to cultural communities via Europeana. And Europeana is a digital portal um, that, as it says, a digital portal that ex sends us to different archives and un helps us um, explore cultural heritage content in a number of different um, environments and spaces. Um, and I think it's only fair that we share a video by Fred Troyen, who is our colleague in the um, Weave project, who very beautifully summarizes the capacity building um, lab days, the Weave project, and some of the other uh, communities we're working with. And within the Weave project, we've used the term cultural communities and minorities. Um, and that's very specific to our project because we were trying to um, spotlight very specific communities that are often not either in mainstream society or seen as actively contributing to um, the cultural heritage sector. And so in that we have the Roma community, the Portuguese folk dance community, we're working with the Slovenian monuments, um, castles and communities. Um, we have the Castellers uh, community in Catalonia, Spain. Um, we have uh, the English uh, historical folk dance community. So again, a number of different um, perspectives are forming our conversations. But without further ado, I would like to play Fred's uh, lovely video. Fred is in the space. And I think it's lovely that Fred many years ago, I think a couple years ago, connected me with Jonas. And it, it was through that friendship that I met Jonas. So thank you, Fred, for, for that, um, yeah, connection. And over to the video of Fred on our capacity building strand. Hello, uh, welcome to this uh, brief lab day. Um, I am Fred Tryon from Leuven University. And uh, together with the partners uh, in WEAVE, uh, WEAVE stands for Wide and European Access to Cultural Communities through European. We are preparing for you uh, a series of capacity building uh, workshops uh, as a second round in lab days that we do to uh, foster understanding and innovation in the way uh, minority content is represented in heritage collections and in particular how this shows in Europeana. As you know Europeana is the European portal to uh, contents of heritage institutions and uh, when you aggregate this uh, content and bring them together from diff uh, different sources, it strikes how the contents have been described from particular points of view. And this poses a special problem uh, for minorities uh, in Europe. Uh, Minorities such as, for, for example, the Roma, Romani people, uh, notice that they have been documented in these official collections essentially as foreigners, as people with another culture that is not the mainstream culture of the institutions that hold uh, these collections and are now in the process of bringing those online. 
And so the idea of our lab days is in the first place to get an understanding of what the real diversity of perspectives in cultural practices really is. And secondly, to derive from that insights in how we could um, teach institution professionals to uh, better the way they add descriptions to their contents and they select and curate these contents. Often these contents have been selected from an external point of view and not from an interest in the symbolic value and the cultural meaning of what the cultural practice is that is documented. And so what we want to offer is uh, insights that we can use to train professionals in the sector. This could be catalographers, archivists, curators, uh, audience developers, to make sure that they see where in the digitization and the description process they can intervene to come to better contents and also how in uh, organizing uh, user engagement activities uh, they can take these perspectives into account. Uh, and this involves both more technical issues such as metadata management as indeed um, curational policies, uh, selection criteria, ways of uh, user empowerment and engagement. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you for your presence uh, today and I hope you enjoy this uh, session. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely video. Um, and I, I think it speaks for itself. And so without further ado, we will now move into our lab day. Um, if you've registered, which obviously you have, <laughs> you received a link to a Padlet. And in that Padlet, it had some of the questions that we as a group were asking ourselves um, and that we wanted to also offer and invite you to, to think about and to consider. And so I will put this Padlet um, into the chat. I've now done that, but if you, I would like to take a two minute uh, just moment to breathe so that you have time to look at those questions, offer anything you'd like to add to the Padlet. The Padlet is open and it will remain open afterwards as well. So you're at, you, you're more than um, welcome to continue to, to have a conversation with us in that digital space. So it's 10.27 in the UK. If you take two minutes, 10.29, we can come back and then we'll move into our discussion. But these are some of the questions and we'd just like you to have a moment to, to breathe and to consider these questions alongside us. I see that you can also ask questions to the question, so please feel free, yes.
Okay. It's a very brief moment to breathe. Um, if we could have the PowerPoint, please, Kosa. So I just thought I would start by um, highlighting. Can I have the first slide, please? So this was an image that I, I struggled a lot with what image to use and what music um, and how do we frame it and what, um, you know, what, what message am I sending by using this image? And I thought it was important to go to Europeana and see what content they had available on dance there, on dance and disability, on disability. And there were several um, images that came up. And for some reason, I kept coming back to this one. And I that you can see um, who's offered this content to the to Europeana. Um, you see the CCBY. So this is all part of when content is um, offered to Europeana. There are a series of um, metadata that needs to be used that sits alongside um, the image. Um, and again, I it's just an image that sat with me in a way it haunted me a little bit but it also felt quite important to use um, there's something about it that feels problematic at the same time um, so yes i just kind of share my 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 process in deciding and this is something i go through for every lab day what is the image i you know we talked with the you know with edis and stuff and jonas and kate you know we all kind of asked ourselves and um what should we use and and so again it was it, it, it's a conversation next slide please um in looking at the content um in europeana um, I'm constantly doing, I feel like I'm auditing Europeana for what dance content they have. Um, and particularly for this lab day, I looked at dance and disability and disability. And here are just some of the, the items that popped up. Um, and, you know, we have a, a paper um, that was openly um, available. We have um, another video that... Um, you know, was was from a Catalan uh, provider. There's a paper here that's called Arte para Todos, Proyecto de Investigación y Creación con Personas con Capacidad, Capacidades Diversas. So Art for Everyone, a project, an investigative research project and creation with people with different abilities. And the paper presents the Art for All project developed by Patio Gererian Heriano Museum in collaboration of the Occupational Center for People with Diverse Abilities of the City Council of Valladolid. The project has its aim to encourage creativity, social integration, autonomy, self-esteem, and people with intellectual disability through creative processes related to contemporary arts. And I'm just reading that so that you see the language that they've chosen to use. There's no judgment at all in any of this content. It's just what was available in Europeana. Um, but again, it, it's starting points for some of the conversations and a lot of the questions we've ha been asking ourselves. Um, the image is from the Bunka Institute in 2010. It's called Invalid Photo Madster. Invalid Solo Performance by Primoz. You have to forgive me for my accent. Primoz Bezjak, directed by Bojan Jablinovic, produced by Via Negativa, Miladi Levy Festival, the Bunker Institute in 2010. So again, I, I don't know if anyone has any thoughts around this. Please feel free to use the chat. Um, yes, next slide, please. So in our conversations, um, Kate, uh, suggested the In Other Words, which is a project that her and her colleagues and other artists um, were creating at Metal. Um, and it, you know, Kay can, can talk about the project in a few moments, um, but it, it felt like a great example of bringing various voices together and different ways of sharing, of 
displaying of offering and and sharing these voices and um yeah so it just again makes us look and question at the role of the archive institutions people how is it that we do bring in other voices what does that mean how do we do that when it comes to body when it comes to lived experiences and how do those lived experiences inform you know, major institutions like Europeana or higher education or artistic um, main theater. So again, just some of the, I just offer those, those um, questions. Next slide, please. And in our conversations, we've, we've um, looked at or discussed counter narratives and counter archives. And what does that really mean? And how does that, uh, play out within this context of dance and disability and able-bodiedness and what is it what does that actually look like and where is it that we want to go and so you know again there's a lot of maybe some might say talking but what would a next step actually be and for me it feels like uh, you know I thought a lot about this image and there I think when when you do sit in spaces where you are feeling disenfranchised or you're constantly up against barriers, you know, you feel that you hit brick walls. And how do you climb over, break through, dismantle these walls? And sometimes walls are really messy and there are different pieces to it that you you somehow have to feel you're up against or do we build a new brick wall do we and what does that wall look like and can it be from multiple perspectives and can these in our case as we're, if we're talking about archives what would the language look like for an archive that is more inclusive that is maybe more accessible um, and you know what is the role of technology in all of this so and, and what is the role of the artist what is the role of the academic of the 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 people that will engage with this archive so i if we could stop the slide now and i think open that up for discussion i know i've said a lot <laughs> um, but this is now an opportunity for my colleagues to respond to reflect to critically engage with some of these you know big concepts but also for all of you to to use the chat feel free to turn your cameras on we're a family friendly environment pet friendly so if cats come in <laughs> children come in that's no problem but also you can feel free to keep your camera off hello marisa um so lovely blue sky behind you lovely <laughs> so yes i invite um my colleagues and friends if they have any any reflections, anything they'd like to share? I, I have I have so many, so I need to think, and I've just tried to populate the Padlet without success. So I'll try and say it, which is my technological failing. It's not, um, it's not the system. I was really, um, I, th I didn't say this in the beginning, but I, I, I don't think I said it, but from my perspective as a, as a disabled person, a crip person, crip artist, so much, this is so, it resonates so much with, with my experience. And when we were listening firstly to Fred's really interesting film, I started to really think about capacity, which gets spoken about a lot in the fields that I find myself in. And I just got really struck by this notion of capacity of what, what a thing can contain. And it, it made me think about that. I, I realized that I have a, a somewhat um, through lived experience, a kind of negative perception, I think of capacity. So when I think about it, I sometimes feel actually it's not about thinking about what more I can do or what more the disabled artists I work with or make space for can do. Actually, part of that is about looking what they're already holding what's already there and this notion of being full up and um, at, at capacity. And I just really, I got really interested in this, how, how capacity is, it exists in the body as in what we know, how we feel, and also what capacity means in terms of what we produce and what we do. That's a really, I've only just started to acknowledge that. So I probably need to sit with it a bit more. Um, and when the thing that I was trying to, um, put into the Padlet is this notion of vocabulary 
And the question in response to the question of how do we develop a vocabulary, I think I'd like to offer the provocation for all of us that that um, we begin to understand that that vocabulary already exists in in um, in uh, minority communities in people who are who are kind of doing their practice or living their lives in the spaces that they're doing that and they have actually already a highly effective vocabulary but we in larger organizations um, I'm thinking of higher education as one of, off the top of my hat we don't know that vocabulary therefore we start to kind of it, it's that pattern of ownership that are, is there a suggestion of by this notion of developing a new vocabulary, are, are we, you know, where is the role of the mainstream in, in the, the, that other vocabulary? Do we all have to speak the same language? Sorry, that bit was waffly, but the, the, the main point of that is I think it's really important that we accept um, it's not about apprentices learning um, a way or a new vocabulary that will enable them to exist in the mainstream. It's about understanding that those, those vocabularies exist and they're actually highly effective. We just don't know them, if that makes sense. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. It does make sense. Yes, Jonas, just, you know, you can leave your microphones on. It doesn't need yes. to be. So. Um, I mean, you already warned it's going to be a messy talk. So I, 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 think, <laughs> I, I, I think I can connect to that. I don't know if, if, if it will be completely clear. But uh, first of all, thank you, Kate. I, I, I completely agree with you that we should really not try to invent new vocabularies, but kind of look for the vocabularies where, they're, where they are established already. And, and look for those minority communities and, and looking how they work with vocabulary and, and the way they, uh, yeah, they, they develop this. At the same time, I was also thinking, or something that interests me a lot is, um, maybe it's, it's not about reinventing uh, the vocabulary, but maybe it's also, it's, I mean, for me, it's a bit of a two-pronged approach. Like on the one hand, it's about looking at that, that specific vocabulary that is developed within these minority communities, but maybe it's also about reinventing or rethinking mainstream vocabulary using a lens of, of dance in, at the intersection of dance and disability. So it's not only about, I mean, if we talk about the archive, it's not only about kind of building a, a new room to the archive, which is specific, but which is also really about kind of rethinking the organization of the house in relation to those uh, questions that are brought in through this lens. And I mean, for, for example, something which I find very interesting. Uh, I mean, we already discussed a lot this idea of messiness. Um, but another uh, idea is very for that for me is very interesting is that when you look at dance through, uh, let's say through this crip lens, you already see that this typical boundaries between high art dance and, and popular dance practices start to blur because a lot of people that that like that are now considered to be uh, disability dancers that, that that work on this intersection, they often come from, but they have a more, let's say, a, a lateral approach or they, they don't come from this traditional, uh, um, not, not all of them, of course, I, I don't want to uh, uh, generalize, but a lot of them come from, let's say, more uh, marginal practices in the sense of they, 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 they have built their practices through popular dance cultures and they, so I think there is, for example, a very interesting place where you can use this lens as a way to rethink certain fixed ideas on how to archive dance and what is important dance pieces and what is uh, less important dance pieces, quote unquote. Um, so yeah, I, to sum up this ramble, um, I think for me, it's a bit about this, what I would like to uh, explore or, or be interested in is this kind of two pronged approach of on the one hand, really build like looking at new words or, or use, searching for words, how to define that are specific, but at the same time, also rethinking these general words and, and maybe also uh, getting rid of certain of those words. Thanks for that, Jonas. And, you know, I really like that visual of, you know, there's a house and not kind of just building another room uh, where, you know, those 
other or you know that content sits but rather what is it within the house that needs to be this metaphorical house that needs to be um reimagined or reworked or reconsidered and what you know what is the role what role can dance play in helping us look at some of that and i think we we know that dance and the body plays a very specific uh and occupies a very specific place in looking at um and helping us ask questions from a very different perspective maybe i i can add to that um um it's within that house it's uh there is also the issue of course like who has the power or, or who gets the power to use words to use vocabularies um and so indeed we i think we agree that this perspective the embodied perspective of artists in general and uh, minorities in particular is often uh, well these groups don't get this power. Um, why not? Because uh, the house is built by a separate sector. We, Fred also referred to the sector. We also do that often in Flanders, the sector. We mean often either the heritage sector or maybe the arts, the funded arts sector. Um, and uh, well, the sector builds houses also like in the, on the micro scale websites catalogues um, funded with project money. Um, and on the Padlet, someone also uh, already referred to controlled vocabularies. If I'm correct, this means that um, if you want uh, content on a website to be found by searches, uh, you want to have it to have tags or uh, so that you can uh, easily find it. Um, and in order for this not to be messy, uh, you want every um, item um, referring to, to um, say, dance, to have the, the tag ta dance and not uh, play or something or not. So, so you want to have it the same tag so that, and you want to categorize that, that's the thing, make categories and you want them to be neat. Well, I wanted that, the sector wants it, but the whole, issue here is uh, how can we combine uh, the um, the archiving and the building of these websites um, but also we should not forget that there are also physical archives obviously that, that are not just digital and online um, um, how can we organize them that they are easy to navigate through and people can find what they look for but at the same time avoid this idea of the whole controlled uh, space. Other terms that are used in that context, technically they are a bit different, but are, is the term uh, uh, authority records. It's, it's about like the authority records, that's like the definitive records uh, describing of giving the biography of an artist, for instance, the authority record or the, the, the data about it. And so it's all uh, organized from this perspective of we, the professionals, the experts, we know it. And it should be this one unique thing, otherwise data get messy. And it's not also for scientists, for researchers, it's not valid and, and so this whole problematic. And I think we should find a solution to that. I admit this is, or this can get technical, we should not do that here. But I think this is where this idea of, we need a vocabulary we stem from, from this phantasma of, we need the, the correct way to address this, which I think we are not going to find. Even if we uh, get vocabularies from minority groups, I think everyone will agree that also there they are dynamic. They don't, they're not fixed, they will change. Um, and I think the sector or everyone building archives and websites and catalogs will need to find a technological and um, yeah, way to to deal with this dy dynamism and also leaving the the opportunity for everyone to really engage with that. Um, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Can can I quickly follow up on that, uh, Rosa? Yes, please. Uh, I think that is indeed the 
core of the problem that we wanted to address in Reef and that we see as a task for this capacity building. And so indeed, there is this tension between the controlled vocabularies that reflect a, a social organization and, 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 and uh, an institutionalization that has led to the way we conceive of dance, dance practices in this case, uh, and which excludes uh, specific uh, perspectives and also uh, uh, practices. Um, and on the other hand, um, and, and, and uh, imposes a certain kind of authority. Yeah? That's also what you mentioned, that, uh, that it is often called an, an authority file. <laughs> uh, um, uh, on the other hand, there is this technology of annotations that we are now exploring in a lot of crowdsourcing activities with, uh, in, in, within the heritage sector where uh, uh, annotation systems are uh, added uh, and where uh, uh, free annotations are collected uh, by the audiences. Uh, and I think what we are looking for is something in the middle of the two, because there is a big problem with annotations, namely that it goes any direction, that it, uh, that it often uh, leads to uh, endless disputes and discussions, eh, because there is indeed this lack of steering, this lack of normalization. So we need something in between where uh, we can keep the 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 descriptions close to the communities and on the other hand help the communities to self institutionalize in a way and to and to have procedures to get to conceptual agreements and so it's a kind of uh, and it are these instruments that we want to develop where you can steer democratic discussions on how things should be named because even within specific communities this is very contentious eh, and very debated and conflicted and and open to evolution so we need in fact platforms that capture the process rather than the result and we now have a lot of ict systems that display the results but the, the interesting is the process and like stuff correctly says this this dynamics and, and evolution of, of, of uh, how people conceptualize their their environment and and how multiple perspectives uh, gain ground there uh, so yeah I, I strongly support what you say it's a very good point in this uh, discussion thank you fred thank you yes it is yeah it's a lot of uh, it sparks a, a lot um uh I, I i i follow i agree i i had to think about the notion of also a, a codification that there's um what i lived very much also as uh, being um the cultural diversity that i li live having two cultures, I felt that um, the dance helped me to overcome the idea that I had to belong to one certain type or, 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 or culture. So it gave me opportunity to, to go beyond that. I remembered in school, because I'm thinking about language and in Flanders, we have this we the Flanders and the and the French speaking was a, there's this politically uh, uh, historical uh, urge and I remember having student colleagues who were speaking French or and it didn't matter because we had we through through dance we were trying the the the, the language became a community uh, a tool to communicate and it was not because you were French or but we felt outside that boundary there was this. Um, there was this uh, uh, conflict in a way. And also when I feel when you go outside of your boundaries, um, you have to, uh, let's say, um, use your way to have a confirmation again, where I felt that here in Flanders as well, um, when I'm with friends and family, they know me, they don't see that I have a different culture. 
but people, when I go outside of the boundary, I get confronted with where are you from? And I say my village language and I say, yeah, that's not what I mean. And I know what they mean. So it is again this, when you go outside of it that you have to justify yourself every, every time again in, in, an, in, an, in an acceptance. And I, I felt that, that the idea that um, when I was in a classical environment, it was very much codified in also literally in the vocabulary but when I went to the contemporary, the, the contemporary, it was also codified. So I felt that the contemporary had also a very fixed and narrow image of that, of that, of that box in a way that I almost felt it is, it, it is too narrow where in Flanders we talk about um, amateurs and professionals but also in the in the level, eh, there is a hierarchy on that. I was very interested in my studies when I went to uh, to to see where postmodern dance, where they were talking about trained and untrained people or dancers that within, but not to have or you are trained or you are not trained, and the more you train, the more you can come become professional. And I was very interested in that way of how to question the codification of, of dance. And I've been using also the labels of um, inclusive dance practices just to when I, to just to make to, to communicate that people were welcome. But the more I think about it, the more it's it almost now becomes an other dance genre, inclusive dance. And it is again codification in the other way. And if I look back in the history, I think there is a label for me that is dance, that is a label that is should be wide enough for any kind of genre to be in. And I, I'm, yeah, it, it because then then it's fixed again. And I'm, we talked the last time about that it should be a fluid concept and that it should be able to move also, I think in, in, the, in the language. Talking about this, I really think I had this image of almost like a matrushka, where an inside and a doll, and where where I don't know, different layers of levels also in the language could be explored. Then to have separate separate entities uh, coming again. So I was just having this idea or this image of a matrushka, how something can evolve or be part of uh, and to have a, con uh, yeah, to stay connected also uh, in that. Thank you, Iris, thank you. And I want to ask a question about process that's been coming up a lot, especially after your comments on the Matrushka dolls, um, Iris, um, and, and dance practices and how that can inform and, and some of the, the, as you were saying, this kind of categorizing that is happening with in a number of ways but before i do that i'd like to honor the the chats the we have staff who said thanks fred i'm looking forward to um hearing more about the work on these aspects and then helen roberts said agreed fred need a starting framework for getting collection connect um, accessible and then ideally we can enhance the data through community contributions again need some one to monitor additions to ensure appropriateness. Thank you for that, Helen. Um, Adina has said great points, Staff and Fred. Staff said dance is a way to be in different rooms at the same time. So let's not lock the quote unquote messy practice up in one room or community or style. Thank you. Sally Lewis has said, agree with what Kate said about the vocab already, already existing and minorities need to be able to trust institutions to share the problem in current time and can create own but wider reach if work together. Thank you, Sally. And Helen should say content not connect. Oh, okay. <laughs> and messy identities for sure. That's from stuff. Thank you. Um, so I don't know if anyone from the chat or that's in the room would like to offer anything to anything that's been said before we move into this next um, question around process. No? Okay. 
So I don't know, Kate, if there's anything that maybe comes to you around being, you know, a dancer as well and how, you know, Edith was just describing her experience of being in entering different spaces and having to, in a way, claim and somehow that felt quite fixed in some environments, but that dance as a term should be more inclusive and should just encompass um, all of these perspectives. So I don't know for you, um, Kate, I've heard you say crip artist a couple of times. I don't know if you want to expand on that. Yeah, I, I, I'd, first thing I'd, I'd like to acknowledge that um, what Iris said really, really resonated with me. And I, I want to share something on that because actually I think it's important. Uh, but just to acknowledge, and I should have done this at the beginning, that I, I understand the complexity of, and I, this is normally my speech that I give when I identify as Crip, that I understand the complexity of the term, I understand the geographical difference, uh, that actually it has really different meanings in different cultural and geographic contexts. But I, it's something that's fairly recent for me to um, kind of wear the identity of, um, of Cripness quite clearly and publicly because it locates me in um, an area of research, of practice, and within a community of people that feels quite powerful. But in total transparency, it's really, it's really new for me. So I'm kind of, play, I'm not, not playing with it. I'm, I'm really, I'm thinking about it still. I just want to kind of really um, back up, back up the, what, what Iris said. You don't, you don't need backing up, but, but um, there's something that I think dance and dance research is not always very good at. That with this, I, I absolutely agree that it has the complete capacity for us to be in different rooms at the same time, which uh, stuff I think is just the most beautiful thing. Uh, it, that will really stay with me. Um, and I do think there's something that transcends um, lots of the stuff, lots of the other stuff. And I'm speaking particularly around disability here. What, what I think I have encountered regularly as a dancer and as a researcher, I can leave the relative autonomous, comfortable practice of being in a dance studio or being in a research setting or a conference. And then as soon as I'm, I can then enter aspects of the wider world and I am hit immediately by the, um, the dominant normative view. And Iris said for her, it, it's where are you from? And for me, it's what happened to you. And, and I think with dances and dance research is not brilliant at acknowledging the discord between those things of what it is to be empowered and kind of be given space and then actually literally in, in the space of moving from one, one part of life to another, that space really shifts. And this has been something that I, and it is relevant, it's hugely relevant for when we think about archiving, because we, there's, it, this cannot be fixed. We can't fix and, and cement a space where everything will always be equal. We need to understand that, that people who exist or identify as other or as part of a minority come in and out of different contexts all the time. Obviously, as human beings, we all do. But I think it, it feels really important to understand the broader things at play. That doesn't really answer your question, Rosa, but I really wanted to no, no. Um, comment on Iris's point. And I think that's a really important, you know, component to an aspect to remember that, you know, this there are constantly shifting, you know, realities that we have to face and this idea of othering or you know, being um, labeled in one way because it kind of situates and it carries a lot of weight and therefore people maybe know how to respond to you when you claim to be yeah. from one community. or But there's a real danger in that as well because then it's like once you're out, you're out. And yeah. what does that do then to the identity? What does that do to the dance practice? Do you then get in a way othered for everything you do? Is there a ghetto that begins to kind of happen? You know, I think in one of our conversations, Kate, you said this kind of collective, you know, that we, we start to kind of compartmentalize and, but there are complexities within those groups as well. And that's what I think the archive can really start to also open up and mm -hmm. highlight the, the varied 
voices, the number of perspectives that might be within a community. And, and just, just to flag, when, when you mentioned the In Other Words book previously, the, for me, one of the, I mean, it, it, I'm very, I'm proud of it because of what it is, but also one of the most important things, and I'm, I, is that as a collection, as an archive, as a tiny, tiny mini archive of ideas and experience, it's full of sameness and difference. And those sameness and differences sit together with with tension but there's there is it's within a framework of um uh not even i'm not even going to say mutual understanding it's just a kind of in a in it's a bit colloquial but it's like a nod to each other it's kind of i don't fully i i don't have the experience that you have but i know something of what you're talking about and i can be with that yeah. and we can be we can be in our sameness and differences it, again it's staff's point of, about say you know different rooms same time it's what where we can be separate and different and where we can be held in in some wider space I just wanted, I think this mutual understanding and this acceptance is so, it's, it's really an essence of not feeling that you have to tick some boxes from, from above. I always, and I feel within Flanders, the, what we talked about, like the, let's say the, the higher art or the professionals or the gatekeepers at that point, um, we, the, the, the initiatives or, or I would say the organizations who have been um, been developed in Flanders, uh, those organizations, I still feel that they that they are dependent on the professional fields if they are allowed or not. Uh, that if they collaborate with a, let's say a professional uh, or more known name, then they get, get viewed. But if they do the work separately, they, they, it, 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 it stays invisible in a way. So you feel that there's still this um, dependency on that, where I feel it, and then they also, it is related that it has to do uh, with the quality and it's such a pity that uh, there's such a norm that is set that it has to, um, where you feel that there is no what you just said, uh, what Kate said, that there, the, the differences, it, I think it's very problematic in a way, also for uh, being, um, yeah, getting viewed also, uh, getting um, uh, media on it, getting uh, uh, writings about it, of what is happening. And I think it's, it's, it, is, it is covered in a way. And, uh, and it is a pity because it is, yeah, it is so so interesting and so rich in what it, what is happening there, but it's it stays under in a way. Um, uh, when I'm just wanting to, yeah, that's a feeling I have. What is happening in Flanders? Uh, I think a lot of the organizations that started who are in the arts started also from more health and care, and they started to go through towards movement. But from the arts itself, I still feel within that field, there is very little really uh, that has been done from the other, from the other point of, of view of bringing uh, those two together, I find. Thank you, Edis. And in the initial, my initial PowerPoint, I asked about a counter archive. And what would a counter archive actually look like in terms of dance and disability and able bodiedness? And, you know, staff asked me, well, do we actually need a counter archive? Um, and so again, the, I see the Padlet has lots of examples and lots of, of um, comments around this. So please do feel free to share your, your thoughts on that. But, you know, one, important point to to I think remember is that this is a space also to say well what could we actually do what is it that archives institutions artists what it what could that next step actually look like and so I invite us all to kind of dream about that one what is a counter archive do we need one and you know 
what would a next step actually look like if all of us that have an interest in this in some capacity, what, what could we do? What, what would we dream of? Jonas? Yes. Uh, <laughs> no, yeah, I, I, I'm thinking. Uh, my answer to that, and it's also a, a, a way to kind of circle back to what Stuff and, and Fred were saying, it would be, I think we, I don't know if we need a counter archive, but I do think we need strategies of counter archiving mm -hmm. or ways to kind of counter this, what um, was called authoritative data. Um, so for me, it's more of a practice. I also don't think, I mean, it's already in this word counter archiving they cannot it doesn't really make sense to have a counter archive on itself because that's just an archive uh, it can only work as a strategy or as a tactics that kind of let's say this disconnects or or, or deconstructs or, or 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 makes fluent again this kind of uh, labels but and on that level because i mean i was very interested and and i mean i, I triggered by this this idea with fred and uh, stuff we're saying about we need the kind of an in-between strategy we need a strategy that is neither simply just pure process because yeah then we don't have an archive uh, but it can also not be this idea of the of like I mean, there's something which interests me but also puzzles me which is it, it's kind of in, in essence it's a question of temporality you know like the, the idea of do we do we see an archive as something which is kind of a progressive building of knowledge that we that we kind of lock into uh, authoritative data and then kind of store away forever, or do we see it as a process that is, is that is a process of constantly rethinking everything? Uh, but I'm I'm I mean I, I really like this idea of we need something in between. I'm just wondering how how is that possible or or what can that in between space be? Um, is this a curated space? For example, like a curated space for annotation, and who curates it? Uh, is is it question of power? Who who has the power to curate these spaces? I, these are questions that kind of came to my mind when I heard you talk about this in between space, uh, which I I think would be for me at least really interesting to explore. Thank you, Jonas. It is. Did you want to? No, no um, I, I think I resonate on the fact of the, the feeling also of being in between. That is something that resonates a lot with me because that has been a space that is was a non-existing. It's like in between stories. It is in, 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 in between cultures. Um, so is that is that an, an unknown territory? Um, I'm also thinking about what kind of strat strategy but of course if it if it falls back into the the classical archives as well i think the the the, the problem i i had when studying at the university as well i was very um I, I was surprised to that it that the the work of 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 many disabled dance artists and in the dance history has been so invisible uh, from that, so I think there, there there exists already a lot, but it's just not not visible. It's not it's not um, shared or known in that in that way. Um, just a thought. Yeah, I I think I just I, there's a couple of things I'd love to contribute. To that I think it is to to carry on with your point. That's that's goes way 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 back into history and cultural archives that mm -hmm. and this notion of um the the disabled performer and i i would argue and i know this is perhaps a controversial provocation i would argue that historically um disabled performers are silenced and nameless and often identified by um, i mean i can see that karen is in this in the room who um, we worked together on a large um, project that included looking back at um, disability in cultural heritage archives, and they are often kind of um, uh, actor with one leg or, or um, dancer with wooden hand, those kind of, and that's how old they are. And I would actually argue we exist to an extent in a modern day version of that. I don't, and I, I, I know that's uncomfortable, but I don't see 
the um, critical voices or the authentic or autonomous voices or experiences of disabled artists really um, present in how we hold, how we understand our dance history. And I think I, I'm stating the obvious, but it feels important in this context. Without that, as a, as a, and I speak from experience, as a disabled performer, you neither see yourself represented in history. So you're kind of foundationless but also it's very difficult to imagine your own future when you know that you won't exist in something that becomes held. And that's an incredibly precarious position to be in. That was the first, and I just wanted to make a super quick comment because uh, many of you will know that I've done some work around the, this notion of the space, the in-between spaces, and, and that is huge for me. So in-between disabled, non-disabled, um, I don't man, woman, there's so many binaries that we are, we exist in in our world and i i find that that space in the middle really exciting there's massive potential in there and I, i'm really drawn to the idea of what it, of that being the archive that the archive is is this potential messy moving um space that sort of resists kind of resists and invites labeling at the same time so that the, I think fred said really early on this idea, and I'm really intrigued by this, this idea of self-institutionalizing. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something about how, how that's navigated. Yeah, sorry, that's a lot. It's a really interesting conversation. I would like maybe to add uh, another in-betweenness, <laughs> or, well, or maybe it's not, but I'm, uh, something else I'm worried in this discussion is the sustainability, the long-term aspect of stories here. Because uh, I, I read Sally uh, uh, contributing something about community archives in the term there. Um, well, maybe we should not go too much into that because context here in Flanders is, is way different from in, in the UK on, on, on this very ID. Um, but if, if I got it right uh, from other talks, uh, um, also in the UK community archives and sustainability, it's a challenge. Um, and so this is actually the maybe the one reason that I feel more still from the idea like there should be developed counter archival strategies from the community's bottom up, but there also should be developed counter archival strategies from in the institutions, and they should meet at some point in order to make sure that even if the communities well, even if the communities are dis get, get dispersed, dispersed or get, you know, because co a community, what's a community? It's a very romantic idea that is actually very problematic, I find very often, uh, but, but okay, that's still another thing, but they are not like there forever. People identify with a community or a group and then, then drop out again and stuff, but especially also for, for money and, and, and time to work on it, uh, if a community only works with volunteers and so on and so forth. We're not even talking about digital infrastructure, which is actually key to this idea of archiving that it's something for next generations or not. I mean, not, I'm not reducing the whole processes surrounding archiving as only having value if it reaches, if it lasts until next generation. But still, I believe this is an aspect that, that we still would like that, that also next generations can still know about some of the disabled artists. Eh? I'm referring to what Kate rightly mentioned. So, so I, this is, yeah, this is a concern from my part that uh, I think it's very good to develop very radical uh, strategies and radicalism then you shouldn't be in the established institutions. So that's very good to do this from, from bottom up within communities. But then it's interesting, like how, how can, you know, can you meet or form um, an alliance or find allies within the institutionalized uh, world. Um, I, I'm just saying this because it is very hard, at least in Flanders, to really turn a community initiative into a new institution um, that, that lasts, because theoretically that's also possible, just do away with the existing institutions and create new ones or something, or create new ones next to the existing. But maybe that's too pragmatic of mine, but I, I don't see this happen. And I think we should, so we should be prepared to, yeah, not to expect too much or something. Um, 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I think at this moment, I would like to acknowledge something Helen Roberts wrote in the chat, because um, it aligns, I think, with what you guys have been saying. Um, if artists could be involved in the initial contextualization and interpretation for categor cataloging archive content, at least it gives it an authority in terms of creator involvement and captures the thinking at the time a work was created. It's very hard from the archive perspective to keep revisiting descriptions. Um, and Mercy has said, interesting conversation. Some of the points make me wonder how things can be categorized in the future with all the acknowledgement of intersectionality. I would imagine that the people who label are in the position of power or decision making for ease of current policy, etc. Not sure that makes sense, but still sitting in my mind. Thank you, Mercy. And then Fred has said, not only is it hard to revisit descriptions, but we should also keep the description history, as this is also part of what we want to relate to and engage with. Thank you. Thank you. And Maybe by... just quickly to add that uh, indeed one of the strategies that is important, but actually that are also already institutionalized practice, I mean, regular archival policy in Flanders, that is that is important to empower the, how is this term in, in English, archive former, so the creator of the archive. So also from, I say this like regular mainstream uh, government policy in Flanders is that um, the, the actual responsibility for the content of an archive, and so the, the, the way it is described and so on, lies with the, the individual, the organization. Um, and then it's the, the task of archive, archives is then just to, to collect this and to make this transparent. I know this is not a real practice, but is the, the, the ideology of, of mainstream ar archivists is that, well, that's not our, problem uh, you know they they should uh, provide this content but you can also turn this in a positive way indeed there is even in mainstream processes there is a there lies a lot of power in making sure that you have an archive to you know to to present to other people and, and that your annotation is good and there is this strange thing i just mentioned this to make sure that we not only kind of blame the archivists but also blame artists, generally speaking, in, uh, at least in Flanders, always pointing at the archives or the institutions, also um, for the people from Flanders, so not only regular archives, like they will keep it, they will keep our heritage, they will, you know, they will store it. We shouldn't deal with, with, with uh, keeping traces for the future. So, so I think, it's good to realize that like we, we should, or artists should also really tackle this. Like, how do I want my work to be uh, presented in the future? And then there are all, all these other issues that we have been talking about. Um, yeah. I, I think I, 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 the, I want to push back a bit on this. Um, not because I disagree. I, of course, I think uh, there's this idea of emancipating the art, art artists and to include artists in the uh, in the question of archiving and how to archive. It's just I, I don't know if I, I mean this this and I'm, maybe I'm exaggerating a bit to make my point. But this idea of the 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 artist as the kind of the final authority of the work it, it kind of tends towards an intentionalist fallacy, which I think. Is exactly why archives are often interesting because they can re be reappropriated, misused, misinterpreted, and I think artists are the first to narrate, like to to kind of make a narrative out of their own oeuvre and to kind of intentionally or unintentionally kind of steer the the, the story, the narrative into certain directions, which I don't think we should necessarily always follow as the as 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 the one who has the authority of the work. That said, of course, I, I completely agree that we should uh, have these communities and, and artists involved. It just, I mean, it's, I think it connects a bit to what you were saying, stuff. It's, it's about this also, it's about emancipating artists, but it's also about emancipating those people who are creating the archives and, and creating that, that dialogue. Um, yeah. Thank you, Jonas. And I see we're slowly coming to the end of our session together. 
Um, but one thing that has continued to come up for me um, was this idea of the ethical component that as archivists, as artists, as researchers, you know, what role and how are we thinking about ethics, you know, and there's a, a real, um, for me, I've done a lot with ethics of care and that what that actually means and the, the and how care exists in a number of spaces. Um, and, you know, these are big topics here, but there is an ethical component here that we need to, I think, be aware of with, when we're working with content, whether that content is an object or a body and those ex that that experiential and those embodied histories how are we ethically caring and really holding that in a way that is genuine fluid messy and so again it's quite you know i, I love this image of the matrushka doll that you know there there are different ways and and you know who you meet might have another layer and that brings us back to to mercy's point on intersectionality now that is a buzzword and that is a you know people use that in a number of different ways um but it is you know a lens i think at its core what it's trying to say is that there are several ways that these um that people's lives and different aspects of those lives intersect and how do we remember that and how can an archive remember that you know, we there there can be different approaches and there can be different bodies. We haven't actually talked very much about that, but you know, what 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 is that body and how does the body exist within these um, cultural heritage sectors? And so again, you know, Kate, you kind of nodded a little bit to that where the you know the the history has kind of dance history is as portrayed the the disabled dancer with the dancer with wooden arm you know and and the problems around that but also the the weight and the power that language has that we shouldn't forget that um, and I know something that I've learned from even just being in the the weave project is always credit the photo how much information can we, you know, really find on that? Do we know the dancer's name? Do we know who provided that content? So that's for me kind of really, yeah, I'm trying to really think what is it and what are the licenses around that? What permissions do we have to use that photo? So again, I, I just wanted to add that in there that that's something for me personally has come up a lot. Um, in listening to all of you. So I will just acknowledge the last couple comments. Helen Roberts said, sadly not in not the case in the UK. I think she was uh, responding to staff maybe speaking. Um, how aware are today's artists of the importance of preserving the content they generate as part of the creative process and for the future? Basically what staff has said. Um, Sally has said in the UK subject specialist networks can link different sizes of archive and can be relatively long standing sustainable as somewhat independent of institutions association of performing has provided a platform for some of these issues. Thank you. Um, Fred often artists contextualize their work in interviews, which could be an important source for archives, I would guess. And Karen has says, I agree with what Yona said, but still co-creating the vocabulary for the archives seems to be careful and respectful. And this would also give power to the artist that so often doesn't happen. And staff said, just an FYI, in Flanders, we developed this website only partially translated to support artists with archiving. And he offers the website link. A lot can be said about it. Feedback, criticism, welcome. But at least it is a start. This being said, the next challenge is then how to preserve and present, describe these archives um, and, what we, and what we've talked about. So thank you everyone um, for all of your uh, thoughts, messy thoughts, links, your um, offerings to the Padlet, to the chat. Um, as we said, I think at the very beginning, this is just the beginning of what we hope are several conversations. We are also learning from you, so please do share any comments, um, any links you want us to, to 
you know, share within the project. Within Weave, we're developing a toolkit that we hope will hold lots of resources. So if there's anything like stuff, you know, the link you've just put, and I've seen the Padlet also holds lots of examples and ideas, do feel free to, to share those with us and develop them also if you have some projects um, that you are working on. Um, thank you to everyone. It was really, really interesting. Um, I've learned a lot and I'm really grateful to everyone for being so vulnerable as well and, and kind of being willing to, to engage in this conversation. So thank you all. Um, Kozer, if we could have our uh, music that will send us off into our day. And we have several Weave Lab days planned. So do check our website and join our newsletter. And thank you. Hi, thank you. Thank you.